Hello and welcome to the latest edition of What Does the Giraffe Say? with me, Kathleen Ritorne. We're an organisation that aims to connect people with conservation efforts around the world by holding interviews on social media. Today I am very happy. I am joined by Matthew Norville and he works for Wilderness Foundation Africa and he's going to be talking about all the stuff that he does in South Africa. Um, so Matthew, if I could hand over to you, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with the organization. No, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so we are um, a smallish conservation uh, non-government organization based in Port Elizabeth in South Africa up the East Coast. Um, I've been with Wilderness Foundation for about 16 years. I was previously with uh, our um, National Parks Agency, South African National Parks. And then I came across to Wilderness Foundation to run a, a sort of mega reserve project in the Eastern Cape called the Bavians Kloof mega reserve. And then when that um, got uh, got wrapped up, then we uh, we started looking for other opportunities and obviously in the land space. And then um, obviously with the, the, the rhino crisis that, that emerged more sort of 2008, then we developed programs around that. And was conservation something you've always been interested in? And what was your background here? <laughs> yeah, so um, I still find that if I'm in a swimming pool, then I'm the I'm the guy um, saving insects and putting them um, on the on the side and resuscitating. But um, yeah, so I think I've always had that interest. I was very lucky, I suppose, with parents that uh, that were interested in I wouldn't say in conservation as such, because I think that was was not so so known as a field, but certainly from a a wildlife and a, and a plant side and just an appreciation of of what we've got around us. Um, yeah, so I was lucky in that in that regard. And was it something that you were studying? Yeah. So again, um, uh, in the early days, well, early days, I'm talking about sort of early early eighties in South Africa. There wasn't really you couldn't go and study a degree in conservation. So you had to had to find something um, compatible, and those, that that era, I did a diploma in in conservation, which was amazing actually. So it was two years of academic studies, and then um, a year practical, and then subsequently I've done um, other qualifications and try to um, align it with uh, with the needs of of yeah contemporary conservation, I guess. And there's several different projects that WFA operate. Today, we're going to be mostly focusing on the rhino side of things. But before we start going in depth with that, um, can you give us a bit of a, a, a rundown of the operations as a whole? Yeah, so we, we've got three main areas that we work in, and it's species, spaces, and people. And so to get the spaces uh, out, out the way, I guess, as, as many other people involved in conservation, we realize that unless you're looking at the, at the habitat and the ecosystems, it doesn't help to save the individual um, species themselves. So we've got quite an active program in that, mainly looking at supporting agencies around protected areas, expansion and consolidation, and, and uh, yeah, quite a big focus on corridors, linkage, linkages. Um, so that's ongoing. Uh, and that has got a natural spillover to the species side. So obviously, if we're looking at land, you just, uh, you know, it doesn't take much to add a, um, a wildlife lay and before you know it, you're looking at, at wildlife introductions or just the conservation thereof, you know, um, habitat loss is such a, such a big problem. So we pay attention there. Um, and on the species side, let's face it, it is mainly rhino at this stage, although we try and look at, at other things as well. And then on the people side, the people side is the, the common thread, I suppose, through everything that we do. And so we've got a youth development program that literally runs um, full-time um, uh, training programs, job readiness, and then trying to get um, youngsters from challenging backgrounds into careers in conservation. And it's we've been quite successful, but COVID definitely has been a challenge there just from the face-to-face -face stuff. For sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, we'll yeah. go further into that as, as we're talking. Um, but, I mean, I know uh, rhinos, everyone, they're very symbolic, they're very en enigmatic, um, they're one of my favourite animals to to be honest. Um, can you explain to those who may not be aware the current status of rhinos and why it's so important to protect them? Yeah, you know, so it's always um, frightening actually. And just in preparation, I just had a look at some of the stats that we that we prepare. And you know, since, since 2008, um, if I can round it up, it's almost 9,000 individual rhino that have died. And you know, it's probably at least that 
um, figure because there were probably carcasses that weren't found. Um, so just, you know, I always say, just trying to imagine um, that figure, it's just astounding. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of dead animals and the horror and um, kind of um, cruelty that goes along with it is, is yeah, um, overwhelming actually. So there's that. And then the, you know, the people also sometimes over, or don't notice the, the loss of potential, future potential, you know. So if, you, if you've poached a cow, a rhino cow who can potentially in their lifetime give birth to eight or ten calves, you've lost that as well. Um, so it's really quite tragic. Um, and also, you know, rhino are, uh, as you said, it's one of your favorite animals, but they are really just these, these gentle giants. And, you know, I say that un until you're being charged by an angry black rhino, then they're not so gentle. But yeah, they're symbolic, I guess, of, of our relationship with wildlife. And there's just so much that I think they add to a landscape. And when they're removed, there is this sense of, of emptiness. And is there one species of rhino that's um, more hunted than another? And if so, why, why would that be the case? Well, you know, just by from a numbers point of view, white rhino have taken the biggest hit just because there are more of them. So... Um, you know, they, they're easier to find, easier to kill, easy, easy to, to poach. Um, black rhino have, have also taken a knock, but to a lesser degree, just because of their, their, their habits um, and their habitat that's a bit harder to get into. So, yeah, white rhino have definitely taken the, the biggest knock. Um, and, you know, they, they're big animals. They, you know, you can get up close. It's, it doesn't, um, yeah, they, they're highly kind of at, at risk, I suppose. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, sure. there's several different factors within your um, your organization's way of trying to stop the poaching of rhinos. So one of these is the anti-poaching and law enforcement. Um, can you talk us through the process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it's it's uh, it was very hard in the, you know, we've been through a couple of these these poaching crisis, crises. You know, I remember in the early 80s when we, when we were still um, studying and I'm in contact with a couple of, um, guys that I studied with um, still, and and you know it's it's happened before, and I I just think the the numbers were not as staggering as they are now, um, and maybe we weren't prepared. So when the crisis really started escalating in in about two thousand and eight, um, it was it was quite hard not to just jump in boots and all. You know, let's do this, let's do that, because it was just it was shocking. Um, but I think we did try and take a bit of a breath and try and see what could we do that we could have the, the, the most impact. So in other words, if, you know, if a certain aspect was being well covered by, by say, national parks or one of the other agencies or one of the other NGOs, then we would say, okay, well, what are the gaps? And we try to identify the gaps and, and then operate in that space. So um, an example is you know, helicopter response time. So it's all very well having trained people or even dogs, but if you if you can't get those people or even a, a vet to get that person to an injured rhino or even an investigator when there's a, a fresh crime scene, so it's things like that that we were just trying to trying to be smart, um, uh, as frustrating as it is, just 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 trying to make an impact. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. It is looking for those gaps, isn't it? Because you, you don't want everyone doing one thing and then these gaps get bigger and bigger. Um, you touched on it briefly just now about the vet support. Um, and also, I know you do establishments of new populations. Um, can you talk to us about this and some of the successes and maybe challenges you've seen here? Yeah, so the veterinary stuff, um, we obviously work uh, alongside an amazing team of, of, of vets and ecologists and even our own small team and then the teams from the agency. So um, a particular vet like, like Dr. Will Folds or Dr. Dave Zimmerman um, work very closely with them um, and Will in particular um, through the, the, the funding from uh, one of our partners, uh, Medivet, uh, allows us to then do those, what we refer to as, as rhino rescue. So we can get get Will to a scene of a, of a, um, of a poaching. And it's very good from a number of, uh, for a number of reasons for the, for the rhino, if the rhino is still alive, but also from a crime scene management point of view, because that's, that gets critical later on if there are arrests. Um, and there have, there have been some successes, but it's very hard, you know, when you get to a, 
a scene and a, a rhino has not only lost its horn, but it's many, maybe lost, you know, half of its face. And maybe there's a calf that's also been killed or maybe the calf is alive, but there have been some successes. Um, not too many on the, on the sort of injury side. Yeah. yeah. So if you find, for example, if you do get there and the calf is still alive, what, what do you do then? What's the process with that? So again, that's maybe a good example where we decided we're not going to go down the route of setting up a, a, a calf orphanage because there are, there are facilities. And so, yeah, that animal will have to go into care. Uh, it'll go, have to go into veterinary care. We've done it a couple of times with slightly older um, uh, calves, but it's very, very expensive. You know, they've got to be fed and watered and milked um, and the, the whole process of, of veterinary care. Um, and they've been traumatized often, so it, it sort of never ends. Um, yeah, so that's, that's I guess, on, on that side of things. And then when, when it comes to the reestablishment of populations, what's the process there and what sort of um, differences have you seen since starting that? Yeah, so, I mean, we, um, I guess that, that was a spin-off from the land work. So there are some, some amazing programs, say, with WWF and their range expansion program. Um, our reestablishment, we're trying to focus specifically on one of the subspecies of, of black rhino, the um, Dicerus bicornis bicornis. So that's the, the commonly referred to as, say, the desert black rhino. Um, and there are very few of those left, and they're very specific on habitat. And so, again, that's why we thought, let's focus on those. Let's try and look at some of the land work that we do, because a lot of our land work is in the um, arid um, sort of north and west of our country, uh, Namaqua land, that, that sort of area, the Suckland Karoo. So as we are working there and developing um, these corridors and expanding existing protected areas, we just started looking more at, at the rhino uh, opportunities. And, yeah, um, during lockdown last year, we were very fortunate to be able to move some some rhino in in uh, in partnership with um, yeah with South African National Parks and some of our other other partners and yeah that was that was fantastic and it, it at least makes up for the downside you know there's nothing worse than seeing dead rhino but there's it's amazing if you can if you can turn it into a positive and let's you know let's develop new populations that's also a, a positive yeah and how do you transport them to the new locations is that helicopters <laughs> or trucks or so last year with the, with the capture, it was in quite difficult terrain. So they were, they were slung. I don't know if you've ever seen images of a rhino being slung upside down by its legs, um, which is amazing. And then into trucks and then on the, on the road. It's literally, uh, yeah, it's into, you know, specific crates that they get, get moved into. And then it's hours and hours on the road. You can obviously only uh, travel at a certain speed. Um, and, and then they get put into bomas on the on the other side where they where they're going to be homed, uh, just to get um, kind of relax and get used to the local f um, conditions and food and things. Um, yeah, but it is a it's a process. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, it yeah. must be quite a sight to see an animal that big upside down. Um, yeah. And then, do, how long do they normally take to kind of get used to the new environment? I know you said you've got the boma there. Is it a set amount of time before they feel comfortable and, and then start making their own kind of home from it? So it's quite unusual. You know, people also might be surprised. So, you know, black and white rhino, white rhino that in the wild are quite relaxed. Black rhino in the wild are, are you know, quite um, aggressive. But when you boma them, uh, roles tend to be re re uh, reversed. So the black rhino that, that we've moved, they actually um, – calm down generally pretty nicely um, in bomas and within a few days they'll, they'll be taking food literally if there's enough trained people uh, from, from their hand. Um, but it just depends, you know, it depends on the individuals and then you see those, those sort of personalities coming out. But generally they, you want to keep them in a, in a boma for, um, you know, a month or six weeks or potentially even a, a bit longer because you just want to really get them calm and as i said very important use to the local um food in the case of black rhino the local browse so it's a it's a huge piece of work because the staff have to go out and cut branches and bring them in so that the rhino can can feed that uh feed from that so they get used to the local local vegetation and sometimes the the local conditions so last year for example when you moved animals it was very cold the temperatures that on the road that particular day started dropping to about four degrees Celsius. 
Um, so, you know, it's like suddenly there's whole new challenges with, with animals that potentially are having to adapt to that. Yeah, I didn't think about that because you're right, okay. especially in South Africa, one area has a very different kind of climate to another one. So there's a whole process then for them to adapt to that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Also, one of the things I love about you guys, and again, it kind of goes back to filling those gaps in, in the market to try and, and make it more complete, um, is the work. There's, there's lots of people, including yourself, doing stuff to tackle the supply side. Um, but what I love about you guys is you're also tackling the demand side with projects uh, with the youth in Vietnam. Um, can you talk us about through this project and any challenges you've seen and also if you've also started to notice a change in attitude? Yeah, so definitely that's one of our um, more rewarding uh, projects. Um, we work specifically in Vietnam. We were lucky to have contact with uh, or make contact with a, um, a particular individual in uh, in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Tan Bui. So Tan is an unusual guy because he grew up in, he is Vietnamese and he, his parents are Vietnamese, but he grew up in Australia. Um, and he he went through a process of, you know, idols and various singing competitions. And then as, as at quite a young age, decided he wanted to go back to Vietnam. And the first time I met him, it, it was amazing because here's a guy that's grown up uh, completely differently, had never been to Africa, never seen Rhino, but he understood the challenge and was really um, embarrassed, I guess, by the impact that, that Vietnam was having. So we, we formed a, a collaboration with him, and then we started trying to, again, trying to identify what can we do. We've only got so much time and so much funding that we can work with. So we thought, let's let's focus on on school kids and let's see if we can't bring them out to South Africa, even if the numbers are quite low. Yeah. So we run these, um, we've run these competitions in some of the international schools. Um, and then the winners we bring out to South Africa and oh my goodness, I think it's easier to move Rhino than it is to bring <laughs> teenagers out from Vietnam to South Africa, just the safety concerns alone. Yeah. But it's all worthwhile when you see those youngsters, lying on a rock in Umfalozi Game Reserve, looking up at the Milky Way, or actually seeing rhino or lion or elephant, for that matter, on foot. Um, and it just changes them. And one of the best quotes I've ever had was when we've, we always meet the parents before, and we always make an effort of meeting the parents afterwards, later in the year. And the parents say things like, the child that you gave back to me is different. And they mean that they've had this amazing experience. They've 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 matured in a, in a yeah in this phenomenal way. So we build up this what we refer to as a, a wild rhino youth ambassadors, and we've got probably about forty or so of them now around the world. Because of course, once they finished at school, they go out and study in the states and Canada and Australia and Europe. Um, and we use them as 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 obviously as as ambassadors and work with them. We also work with universities um, and then with business people. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's just a way, an ongoing, ongoing, we'll, we'll keep doing it. As I say, even though the numbers are quite low, it's definitely worth it. Um, and as you say, it's very hard to, to gauge. Is it having an impact? But it's certainly not doing any harm. So we'll, we, we'll keep tapping away. And when you're first going into the schools, um, I'm imagining you're having this conversation about the rhinos. What is what? What are their beliefs at that time? Do, do they do they know people that use the horn? Do they think it's a good thing? What what's their kind of opinion at that time? So the first thing is maybe often people say, "Why do you go to the the, um, the international schools?" Because those are um, the more privileged youngsters, um, and we do that because that's generally the market that can afford um, a rhino horn at a certain level. I mean, they are kind of differences in the market, but that's why we do that. Every single time we've gone to a school of all ages, um, we've always had some experience. It, it's either a very young kid that puts his hand up and, and blurts out, you know, my dad's got a rhino horn at home. Or um, So we've always had uh, something like that, uh, which in a way, although it's not good, it shows us we, we are hitting the right uh, groupings. Um, most of the time, there's there's horror itself. The kids don't at that age. They, their experience of rhino horn is is you know non-existent, but it's their parents and their uncles um, and grandparents. And we we subtly, I suppose, using the kids to influence. Um, 
Yeah, but there is an awareness, but there's there's unfortunately that disconnect. There's a disconnect between a rhino killed in South Africa in the most horrific way, and then this very kind of clean product that you can maybe buy as ground up. Um, so yeah, that's one of the challenges. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, when where they're buying it, they, it's very easy to not think about how that actually came into your hands, you know, and, and the, the horrific, as you say, process it went through. Um, and then now, once they've finished, I mean, you said earlier their parents have said brought back a different child. But have have you ever had any stories of the children saying that you know they've spoken to their parents about it and changed attitudes here? Yeah, we we definitely have had that. We had, uh, I mean, a couple of examples that come to mind. You'll have, um, I've had youngsters in tears before we've even gone out on, you know, to have that wildlife experience. And then you've got to be careful because, you know, they might just be missing their parents or they might be nervous or whatever it is. But actually, it, it came out because what we were saying was so close to home for, for her in this particular case, where she knew that, that um, family members were using rhino horns. So I think that emotionally that, that was very close. We've had that. And then we've had another one of our ambassadors that it probably took a year or more uh, for him then to say, actually, my uncle's got a whole rhino horn set up uh, as a sort of a, a bragging or a status piece in his, in his apartment. So, yeah, it's, it's there and, and it, it is real. Um, but we do hope that we're having some, some impact. I think it would be impossible not to. I think yeah. most organizations I speak with, a lot of it comes down to the fact that if you bring people to see the animals, then they're going to want to protect them because they fall in love with what they're seeing. Yeah, yeah. Another um, positive one, in, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, we um, a couple of years ago, I just had this almost, um, not obsession, but this real desire to go to the, na the National Park in Vietnam where they lost their last rhino in 2010. Um, more as a symbolic thing, but I just wanted to feel what was it like to go to a, a, a national park where the, the last rhino had been killed. Um, and that was quite amazing, actually. It was, it was a very, I found it a very you know, emotional and, and kind of a haunting experience. So it's cut in National Park that's, you know, a couple of hundred kilometers north of Ho Chi Minh City. But what was amazing there was the, the interaction we had with the park, uh, park management. They, they really went all out to welcome uh, welcome us and took us on extended walks and explained to us the the issues and it was amazing we actually we found something common even though there was a you know language challenges and we you know ten thousand kilometers away but I think that also gave us some motivation to try and try and not let that happen here yeah I think people forget most times when people think of rhinos they think of them as being an African animal and they forget that actually they are in in other countries such as Vietnam pick places where yeah. work. Um, what's the general sentiment then about them losing their rhinos? Is it something they're sad about? I mean, what's the, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think I think it is an overwhelming sadness because the, you know the chances, um, although just technology and and veterinary um, advances make it possible to to reintroduce them, the reality is that the the number of Javan rhino that are left, you know, is seventy or eighty. So. The risks of messing with that population to try and do a reintroduction into Vietnam is is very risky. So yeah. I think there's this realization that it's probably not going to happen, and so we've we've allowed an animal to go extinct in in beautiful habitat uh, that really could uh, could support them, but but can't. So I think there is a, a sense of of embarrassment and shame. I get that a lot in Vietnam, especially amongst the youngsters. They they are ashamed that their country has lost the animals and is now contributing to loss in Africa. Yeah, I mean, hopefully there will be the youth that will come through and be the, the ambassadors as we go forward. Um, yeah. Again, we touched on it earlier at the start, and I don't think there's a single conversation around the world that doesn't include the word COVID at the minute. Um, how has that impacted the work that you're doing? And if people are watching back home and they're wanting to be able to support you guys, what's the best way and how can they do that? Yeah, so COVID definitely had an impact. We were lucky because conservation in, in this country, in South Africa, was, was uh, classified as an essential service. So we could largely still operate, but it definitely had a huge impact on, as an example, Vietnam. So we couldn't go to Vietnam last year to do our work, and it's unlikely we're going to go this year. 
Um, but it had a huge impact on tourism, obviously, around the world. But in our particular case, it means that reserves that had local and international tourists that would come and see wildlife, including rhino, couldn't travel. So suddenly those jobs and livelihoods that were supported by wildlife, that is such a great story, now couldn't, couldn't take place. So it was a, it was a huge challenge. Um, a lot of people lost their jobs. Yeah. And we had to rethink some of the, the approaches. So, for example, around some of the parks, a lot of our, um, uh, our staff, especially on the youth development side, were then in, involved in um, um, food packages and supporting vegetable gardens and that kind of activity uh, to just try and get people through those critical couple of months. Luckily, um, most people are back at, at work, but there's a lot of people that have still lost their jobs and, and, and that's not going to come back soon. And then if people want to support you, what, um, it's, uh, um, what is, it, is it fundraising? Is it time? What sort of things can they do? So the, f the first thing is I always say just by sharing our stuff on social media, particularly on the, on the Rhino um, things, you are helping without having to, to do anything else than, than give a bit of time. So our, you know, our website uh, details are there on on social media on Instagram. We're quite strong with with a Vietnamese campaign, and that's the um, Wild Rhino. So that's that's one way. Of course, we an NGO. We got to work. We can only work on on funding, but you know, and and sometimes relatively small amounts can go quite far. So we've literally had little old ladies, uh, you know, in the UK that have have donated, you know, relatively small amounts, but they want to make an impact, and we can we can. We can use that funding and we can always show. I personally like to show where that funding has gone. A hundred pounds went to support, you know, five hours of anti-poaching um, patrols in a, from a, a small aircraft or dog food or whatever it happened to be. So we, we're very happy to, to talk to people about that, obviously. Uh, we've got amazing partners, though. You know, I mentioned Medivet, uh, Volkswagen, uh, Tusk Trust, um, and uh, Treadright. Um, Olsen Animal Trust in the UK, um, yeah, without them, it just, it just wouldn't be, be possible. So um, we do get a lot of help and we're very appreciative, but obviously more funding allows for more, more action on the ground. Sure. And then during COVID, do you think that there's been an uptick in rhino poaching or do you think that the, it's more difficult than, for them to then get the, the horns out of the countries now? What, what's your take on that? I think there was, and it's a bit anecdotal, but I think everybody generally agrees that there was probably a, a bit of a downturn just because with the lockdown, you know, we were in, in quite strict lockdown so and curfews and things. So you couldn't, you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to drive to a reserve if you, if your intention was to poach um, rhino. Obviously in some, some of the reserves, people come in from foot from afar. So that, you know, they were still doing that, but I think the numbers were, were, were down just because I think people, a lot of people were in survival mode. The opportunities to get um, uh, and uh, horn and other products out of the country was um, was definitely down, but um, I think that picked up. And, and you know these these criminal networks they they know how to work around the law, obviously. And you know COVID maybe maybe at a later stage they they used the opportunity to move um, products that were you know the authorities were more focused on on COVID. Yeah. Sure. Okay, well, I've only got one more question left. Um, if you're watching back home and you would like to put a question towards Matthew, then please do pop it in the comments section below and I'd be happy to do so. If you're watching this and it's not live, do still feel free to pop a question in and one of us will get back to you with a response to your question. Um, I always like to end things on a bit of a positive note. So, Matthew, what I'd love to know is what's your favourite success story? Um... I, th I think, I mean, some of the ones that I've mentioned already, just the, you know, to see those Vietnamese kids um, having this amazing wildlife experience. We, literally, the one story is, that's what I was hinting at, these beautiful, big, rocky outcrops, adjo you know, next to the Umfalozi River in that fantastic game reserve and kids staring up as, the, as it gets dark and then not knowing what it is. Like, what is that? That's the Milky Way. You know, that, that makes it um, certainly worthwhile. Um, so those are amazing. I literally get goosebumps as I tell you. Um, and yeah, working with those kids definitely gives us hope. As you said, the youth are going to make the difference. 
And then those, those animals that we moved last year, those rhino, the one has had a calf. So if you look at the images of that, uh, I mean, really, that doesn't, it doesn't get better than that. You're now bringing new life into the world. It's, an, it's a new animal to add to the, the overall population. That's definitely, definitely positive. Yeah. Um, and what are your hopes for the, for the future, um, for the organization and the work that you're doing going forward? Yeah, we'll, we'll always streamline. We're constantly looking at better ways of, of doing, doing things. So I think the youth develop, uh, the, the, uh, the Vietnamese um, demand reduction or demand elimination, as we like to refer to it now, we'll, we'll continue with that until literally the problem is solved. But I think we are now more and more looking at the land, uh, habitat, rhino, and other wildlife overlay. And people might go, why, why do you keep focusing on rhino? Because if you do, if you do the rhino, a lot of the other animals come with it. Um, you know, so they just, by association, they're going to benefit from that kind of large mammal conservation as well. And we've got a question coming in from Jennifer Ann, and she's coming from the USA. And she is asking, how can students get into conservation? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I also like like those kind of questions, and I always say because you get some some um, opinions that you know the world's doomed. Why go into conservation? You're not going to make much money, and what's the point? We're going to lose everything anyway. I don't believe that, and I think the more people we can get studying conservation, the better. It's an amazing uh, career. It's an amazing uh, way of life, and you're going to have experiences that you're not going to get in any other field. Um, most of the time, you know, it, to study conservation, almost any university has some kind of natural sciences faculty. That's, that's generally a good base, basis. Um, and then that will give you an indication, are you more leaning towards general ecology or maybe the botanical side or the zoological side? Um, but yeah, that's, that would be a good, good way to start. I love that. I think that's such a nice message to end on as well, just saying that there is hope and to not feel like there's, there's no point. I completely agree with your sentiments. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap up now. We've had some lovely comments coming through while we've been talking, and lots of positivity, lots of people supporting the work that you're doing. Um, please do, everyone, if you're watching back home, as we say, like, comment, share these stories, because it's from doing this that we can help people become more aware of the work that people are doing in conservation. Um, oh, actually, I've just got another quick question coming through from my friend, actually, Will. Um, he is asking, does he know of any other methods of demand elimination that are working as well? Um, yeah, you know, so there are various organizations that, that have different approaches. Um, so Wild Aid, for example, believes in, you know, using celebrities and, and big billboards, um, you know, big budget stuff. Um, and, and that must have an impact. It definitely has an impact because when we go to Vietnam, people are constantly feeding back the, the messages that, that um, those, that organization, various other organizations are doing. So, yeah, I think, I, th I think all these things together, uh, different approaches, um, you know, are going to have the, the impact. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the pers the personal relationship is the way that we go, but it's not the only way. Um, so there are many, and just, you know, education in general, um, and I almost don't like the word education because it implies people don't know something, but it's more awareness raising. Um, so, yeah, just building awareness and, you know, almost that point that you said earlier, if you don't understand that rhino horn comes from a living, breathing being that gets killed in a brutal way, you're not going to not want to use it. So if you just build that awareness... So any awareness um, programs are good. And we work with a host of, of other organizations. I saw traffic was referred to. We're in constant contact with traffic in Vietnam, um, various other organize, organizations there. Uh, Change has got a different approach. Um, uh, yeah, ENV um, uh, in, in Vietnam, all great. Um, they, they also do a lot of stuff on the ground, which is fantastic and all contributes. And I'll just take this final one from Priscilla Lambert. And she's saying, is there another alternative for wildlife organizations to merge if funds are being stretched? Um, it's it's maybe, a, maybe a novel idea. Um, but you, you probably find most of the time when you scratch a little bit, um, you know, even in, in South Africa, there are many um, uh, NGOs working in, in, in conservation. But most of the time, the reason why they haven't merged is because they've got either slightly different approaches. 
slightly, or they have fundamental different, you know, different approaches. Like we believe, you know, we don't believe in the trade of rhino horn. Other organisations do. So the chance of, of, you know, as an example there, of merging are, are slight, but it's it's not impossible. And I think there are also a lot of um, kind of uh, associations of like-minded NGOs that work very closely together. So yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll, we'll wrap up now then. Matthew, is there anything that you would like to say before we say goodbye? Um, yeah, I suppose just, you know, so if we're talking rhino, just think that those rhino belong to everybody, no matter where you are in the world. And so do the resources of our country. But in a similar way, I want to be able to travel to wherever you are and, and enjoy what, what your natural beauty is. So it's a universal challenge and we can all make an impact no matter how small. Um, so yeah, let's just stay positive and, and see if we can try and keep things as, as natural as possible. Excellent. I don't think I could add any more to say that any better. So thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you everyone back home for watching. Um, hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And if you've enjoyed the conversation, then please check out What Does the Giraffe Say Media's page where you'll see plenty of other interviews with other organizations around the world. And stay tuned for more interviews going forward. And as Matthew said, please do like, follow, and share their page on Instagram, Facebook, and help spread the word of the work that they're doing. But from me, thank you so much for everything and enjoy the rest of your day.